Hello, my name is Sean Lacey. I'm the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer for the University. And in this video, I'm going to do a short presentation on human research ethics screening process in the university. It's important to state, uh, I suppose, from the outset that the process that's going to be summarized in this uh, next couple of slides and essentially the checklist that's also going to be covered is for guidance to the research ethical review required and may need to be, I suppose, complemented by having a discussion with uh, colleagues with a more uh, with experience in the actual uh, research area, whatever the, the context that she is. Uh, in our human research ethics policy, it is stated that any research activity that involves humans as research participants must undergo a formal ethical review prior to the commencement of the actual research. And then I suppose it's only natural then to think of, look, what will be examples of, of where humans are seen as research participants? And for me personally, I'm always slow in putting together a list of examples because sometimes it may be interpreted as an exhaustive list and that's obviously not the case. And you can see here, even on the last line here, it's underlined that it's not limited to, but I think it's obviously, it's important as well to maybe give a couple of examples. So I suppose the, the flag for this is, or the caveat is this, this is not an exhaustive list. But I suppose where you're looking at data collection through questionnaires or interviews or focus groups, web surveys or any observation studies, that will be seen as where you're carrying out uh, research with unhuman participants. If you're looking at access to data sets, uh, where you may, maybe you're looking at case files or records concerning identifiable individuals, that again would fall under this category, or also where you may be conducting internet mediated research. Now it's in relation to this last one, that's quite a broad topic in itself. And there's a lot of guidance on that actual uh, discipline. And at the last slide of the slide deck, there is a reference to the British Psychological Society Ethics Guidelines for Internet Mediated Research. And if you're going down that route of doing IMR, it's definitely worth checking out the, the ethics guidelines in relation to that type of research as well. Now, for the purpose, of, I suppose, of this presentation and the, the screening process that we're looking to do, I suppose the guidance that we'd have would generally, I suppose, be underpinned by having three principles when it comes to the research which is in terms of the research methods, the research participants, and then what is the research context. And I, again, I suppose the, uh, the caveat to all this is just to um, let, I suppose, colleagues know that the university, so MTU, is not an approved clinical trials research ethics committee. So if you're looking at carrying out research on human participants, but it would fall under the bracket of clinical trials, then that would not be for the university's research, human research ethics committee but it would be important to reach out to the chairperson of the Human Research Ethics Committee for guidance on good practice and the next steps in that regard as well. And I suppose when it comes to going back to the three principles in relation to methods, participants and contexts, it very much depends on what each one actually is to the, I suppose, the level of ethical review that is required, whereby is it a minimal risk human research ethics application that form that's needed to be completed or full ethical review human research ethics application form to be, to be completed? So I suppose what, what's clear for that one then is the idea of minimal risk. And I think what is good is maybe to kind of get a definition of research of, of minimal risk. And I'm actually going to read this out now. Personally, I'm not a massive fan of reading text from an actual slide, but I think that this is a, an important wording to get correct. And this is taken from the Code of Federal Regulations, which is a protection of, in relation to the protection of human subjects. So this is over in the US back in 2017. So the definition is taken from that. So research in which the probability and magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research are not greater in and of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or during the performance of routine physical or psychological examinations or tests. So this is the definition that we work from in the university in terms of minimal risk. And anything that I suppose that is beyond this would then is where we're moving from or where we may be transitioning from minimal risk ethical review to full ethical review. Now it's obviously very much dependent on the context, depending on the participants and the methods being applied but this gives us a guidance to where we are looking at. So just kind of, I suppose, give a couple of examples in relation to the three principles of methods, participants and context. So if we look at the top row here, if we're collecting data and it's going to be anonymous data or we're collecting data to, uh, kind of, I suppose, or the data has already been collected, apologies, the data has already been collected and we're using it with informed consent, obviously, well, then this is where our method would be, be minimal risk. 
then the I suppose the transition to full ethical review uh, would be maybe where we're doing focus groups, interviews, or observational studies. Now I suppose why this is migrating over to a full ethical review or somewhere in between is because this is where now participants now are known. So there's a certain identity here, and then it's a case of well, how that how is that being managed? And then if we're moving to doing a controlled trial intervention study or carrying out a medical procedure, which again falls under I suppose the clinical trials a research ethics committee then that's where there's a full ethical review. But again, obviously, the caveat being on the previous slide is where the university is not, uh, um, I suppose, it does not do, uh, I suppose, that type of ethical review. So then the next bit then will be participants. So if we're looking at dealing with uh, competent adults, well, then that's, that's obviously the minimal risk. So that's a, obviously a good place. No, it's obviously, sorry, it's not that it needs to be good or bad, but I suppose it's just down to the, the review that's required. It will be dependent on the participants. Then as that moves to maybe looking at students, peers or work colleagues, this is where we're in that transitionary phase of minimal to full ethical review. Now, sometimes it could be a case of, well, why, why if you're carrying out uh, maybe a study on students or work colleagues, why would that not be just minimal risk? And I suppose what we'd have to be careful of, and this would be very much dependent on the research context, is the power imbalance. Like maybe there's a certain, I suppose, pressure from the participants to do something because of the relationship with the uh, the facilitator or the researcher. Now, maybe that's not the case as well, but I suppose that's where that ethical review will then kind of give guidance and give support in that regard. And so that's why then it's in that kind of transitionary phase. Then as we move over to looking at vulnerable groups, and this is vulnerable groups is where you're looking at participants that don't have the capacity to guard themselves against harm or exploitation or to report such harm or exploitation. Now, that's a very important topic in itself, as in if you're dealing with uh, vulnerable groups. And a reference that we have at the end of the slide deck as well is from the Health Service Executive, so safeguarding vulnerable persons at risk of abuse. There's a national policy and procedures that's referenced, and it's also up in Canvas as well. And I suppose that's definitely worth reading if you're going to be carrying out research on vulnerable groups. And again, I suppose some research won't be on vulnerable groups, so that reference, that level of detail won't be uh, be required. But if we're carrying out research on vulnerable groups, then that's obviously something that needs to be looked into. Then if we're looking at the research context, so this is where you're maybe gathering non-sensitive information. So this is kind of generally general information that won't upset anybody or make them uncomfortable. But then that's obviously where you're looking at minimal risk. But then if, as you move to gathering personal data or you're gathering data that is, I suppose, identifying your participants or running the risk of identifying the participants, well, then that's now where you're in this kind of transitionary phase as a guideline. And then if you're carrying out research that may stigmatize or, I suppose, cause anxiety, discomfort or, or embarrassment to participants, that's then where we're looking at full ethical review. So just to go into each one of these in a bit more detail now, well, not massive detail, but just kind of give a bit of, I suppose, a checklist because... I mean, this table in itself or this image in itself doesn't, I mean, it's not exhaustive, but I suppose it, where, how do we know which category we're really falling into? Like maybe we're in between, we we'll say, anonymous data collection and focus groups and look where, what guidance is there in that regard. So if you look at the research methods, so there's this checklist that we, we've been working with. And I suppose the idea that we have here for this is if we're carrying out a study and we're ticking yes to any of these, well, then this is where full ethical review will be required. While if we're ticking no, well, then uh, uh, that would be given, I suppose, uh, I suppose, giving us guidance that we're looking at a minimal risk review. Now, that would depend on the other checklist that we're going to have in the next couple of slides as well. OK, now I won't read all of these out in detail. I suppose it's just I'm more than happy, I suppose, on the canvas, on the discussions that if there's any more detail needed or any questions that we'd actually use that uh, as the as was the mechanism for uh, that Q&A or that frequently asked those frequently asked questions. But I suppose if we just look at it uh, we can see here the first two questions is if you're carrying out a research where there's no consent that's obviously something that again it's not that it can't be done but there's that where we need to have that full ethical review if we're looking at deceiving or withholding information from uh, participants that's obviously something that needs to be looked at if there's going to be inducements if we're looking at not so and just just to jump through a couple of them because I, 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 everyone can read them in their own time as well to, uh, but maybe the seventh one here if you're looking at storing your data unsecurely or your results unsecurely well then that's obviously something that we wouldn't be aligned with uh, I suppose good practice so that's why again why would that be the case so that's where you would need a full ethical review if you're looking at carrying out surveys or interviews this is point nine of where your participants are, identities could be known. Again, that's something that we, it's not that this can't be done, but that's where the full ethical review would be required as opposed to minimal risk. 
And if I just read out the 11th one there, dealing with topics using methodologies or reporting of findings in a way that is likely to cause anxiety, discomfort, embarrassment, pain, or changes to lifestyle for participants. Again, that's where you'd have that full ethical review. So the idea to this, I suppose, checklist when it comes to the research methods is if we tick any of the yeses here, then that's where you're going down the full ethical review uh, application form. Then if we move over to the participants, so for so this is, uh, I suppose, the human participants that are involved in the study, what information do we have on them? Well, if they're under 18, then that's obviously where a full ethical review would be required. If the participant is not voluntary, if there's uh, learning difficulties or language difficulties, so that's points 15, 16, and 17, just grouping them together. That's again where you'd have full ethical review. If I jump down to 22 there, persons in unequal relationships, so that's a kind of power imbalance that I mentioned on a previous slide. That's kind of again where you're looking at that uh, uh, full ethical review. If you're looking at where there's a potential conflict of interest in the research, with you being the researcher, that you might have a conflict of interest in the research that you're carrying out, well then again that's where full ethical review uh, may, would be required in that case. I suppose, and Jen, just to look at the 19 point here, of participants who may not have the authority or capacity to give informed consent. So that's obviously where we're going down that route of vulnerable groups. And there's a reference that's going to be on the last slide as well from um, Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. So that's from 2015. So that would be, I suppose, well worth to read if we feel that you're going to have participants that uh, don't have the authority or compar a capacity to give informed consent that you kind of familiarize yourself with that act. And again, the reference is on, on, going to be on the last slide. So the kind of, I suppose it's the second last checklist, but it's the main one, I suppose, the last one in relation to the kind of the three principles that we're looking at. And this is in relation to the research context. So if you're carrying out research with that involves sensitive issues, for example, suicide, bereavement, uh, sexuality, and so on like that, well, then that's where full ethical review would be required. If you're looking at, again, I won't read them all out, but if you're looking at any act that might diminish self-respect or cause shame or embarrassment or regret, that again, that is essentially look is where you're going to be doing something that's sensitive. So that's where full ethical review would be required. If you're going to stigmatize or stereotype groups, that's down to point 31. Point 32, if you're carrying out health research, um, as outlined in the health research regulations. Now, health research is beyond, is, it includes clinical trials, but it's more, it's different, it can be separate clinical trials as well. So it's not that you could be carrying out health research and it wouldn't be coming cr across the Human Research Ethics Committee uh, in the university. And I suppose, when it comes to health research and the regulations around them, they're quite vast as well. And there's a reference again on the, the last slide of the Data Protection Act in relation to health research from 2018. Uh, so that would be well worth checking out if you're going to be doing a health research and you'd be familiarizing yourself with the re health research regulations in that case. The last checklist, and this doesn't, I suppose, fall into the... Um, into, I suppose, the three principles, but it's just more, it's just useful to put it in here at this point, is where you might have ethical review already. So if you've ethical review, received research ethical review from an approved body, well, then that would obviously, if you take yes to this, then that would obviously be in the case of where you'd be looking at a minimal risk. Now, the yes on the previous three slides, if you take yes, and I'll just shoot back to these. So if we take yes to these here, that's where you're looking at full ethical review. If you take no to all of these, or that's where you're looking at a minimal risk uh, review in that case, okay? And for this one, then it's the flip on this then. So if you have approval from an approved body, a research ethical approval from an approved body, well then obviously that will be a minimal risk in this case as opposed to a full ethical review. And equally, if you have ethical approval or research ethical approval from an approved body, but you're looking to gather information from participants that are from MTU, well then that's obviously again, it will be a, that will be classified as a kind of a minimal risk and what will expedites that process is the fact that there has been ethical review uh, from an approved body. So look, I can only imagine that there, be, there could be questions in this. And again, I mean, trying to keep all these presentations short, but I also trying to explain it, but I uh, explain things in enough detail. But if there are questions where I really recommend then that you uh, kind of utilize the functionality of the discussions on Canvas so you can ask the questions. And when you ask these questions, just make sure you put in an appropriate title because these questions, you know, if appropriate, they, they can, you know, we leave them up there and, you know, uh, other, I suppose, colleagues that uh, register for the module can answer the questions and equally I'll obviously have oversight as well but we can have that kind of open discussion which I really help I suppose will help promote a kind of a shared learning environment when it comes to getting a handle on 
I suppose, re human research ethics, the application process, and so on like that. Okay, so I strongly encourage that any questions that you may have would be directed to the discussions functionality on the Canvas module. And then the, here are the references. I would have mentioned all these at some point throughout this presentation. The one thing that I, leave, I don't state as references, but it's a given and they're up on the Canvas module, are our codes, policies, and procedures that we would have in relation to, to research, uh, I suppose, research practice as well. Okay, so I don't call them out here, but they're obviously, they're quite important and they're up on our, the Canvas module. Look, that's it for now. Okay, all the best. Bye.